I think there's a real sense of shock when the war breaks out. Um, uh, you know, we can we can overdetermine the expectation that war will come. Um, uh, you know, this is a Europe that has got used to peace, uh, and sure, there have been wars in the Balkans very recently, um, but um, you know, the, the 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 economies of these countries uh, are, are interlocked. People travel across borders very happily. They go to on holiday abroad if they're wealthy enough. Um, so there's a real sense of surprise. Um, Jean-Jacques Becker, a French historian, um, wrote the first really serious study of, uh, which tried to establish how populations responded when the war broke out. And he used three categories. Um, one was shock. Uh, one was what he called sang froid, I mean, acceptance. Um, and, and, and the third was enthusiasm. And what he's found in the case of the French army was that enthusiasm was only shown at the last moment when the troops were going to the front, when clearly families felt they had to support their, their husbands and fathers as they were going on, their sons as they were going to war. Um, but the initial reaction is a mixture of shock and then acceptance. People go to war because they have to go to war because there's a sense of duty. They don't go to war out of enthusiasm. My understanding of the outbreak of this war is that it begins as a local limited war. Vienna wants a war with Serbia. It wants to deal with its Balkan problems. And it has concluded that war is now the only way that it can resolve its, its weakening position in the Balkans. And we know that we've got the documents. Everybody else we have to speculate. In the case of Austria-Hungary, we have the documents. We show clearly from the very beginning of the crisis after the assassination they plan for war with Serbia. That is what they're, they're trying to achieve. But they don't want a world war. They don't even want a great European war. They want a limited local war. Um, and they want to defeat Serbia. And then, of course, Serbia, because Serbia will be defeated, it thinks, it does very well against, on its own against Austria-Hungary, has to bring Russia in because only thus will it, will it, will it, will it, will it survive. Um, and that's the point when the war expands, when the other powers are brought in. Um, when, because Serbia really has no choice, and Serbia will be crushed, uh, it thinks, um, if, if it doesn't get that support. Britain, uh, the death rate for Britain in the First World War is twice what it is in the Second World War. Um, so uh, it's, it, you know, it has a much greater effect on Britain. And Britain too, remember, between 1856 and the end of the Crimean War, um, and 1914, Britain only fights one international war, it, it, which is the war in South Africa against the Boers. The Boer against the, in every European war, it has been neutral. It has not been part of them. So the shock is greater when it comes, and then the impact is greater than any other war that Britain fights between 1815 until 19 or until 2014. You know that, that, that. So, so it is big. What I think is what's happened though is we've lost any connection with the immediacy of it. If I speak to school children, they don't know of their own personal connection to this war. They don't know that whether they have a family connection or don't have a family connection. I mean, the reality is they do have a family connection because every family in Britain does have a connection. Um, but, they, but they don't know it. So the memory has been lost. Um, and, and, and when people talk about remembrance, they're wrong. It's not about remembrance because nobody remembers. It's about rediscovering and reconnecting with this war. I was talking about what Europe was like before 1914. Um, after 1918, uh, it, there is no globalized, interconnected economic system. You know, it, it, the, the nearest connection you have between the situation before 1914 um, is today. You know, th this is the, the closest we've got back to that degree of connectedness. Second thing I suppose that is important is that it's not immediate, it's not self-evident straight away, well, though most are beginning to be aware of it, but Europe has lost its primacy in the world. I mean, Europe is, is you know, Europe is the center of the world in 1914. Uh, Europe is not the center of the world in 1918 anymore. Um, and in particular, of course, the United States has, has come, the new world has come to the rescue of the old world. And then I suppose the third thing is that actually the war does not end easily in 1918. You know, there is war, civil war in Russia, war between Poland and Russia, um, 
fighting throughout Central Europe, fighting in North Africa, fighting in Central Asia, um, the war carries on. Um, so it becomes an era of violence which doesn't end. And to that extent, I, I don't think there's any necessary collection, connection to the Second World War, but what there is is an undercurrent that violence is a way to achieve political objectives.